everyone, my name's Annie Hanma, and I am here tonight to be the diversity. That's right, not only am I female, I'm not even a physicist. Hooray! I'm from the University of Sydney School of History and Philosophy of Science. Hooray! Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. And, um, but for those of you who are enterprising, you may find that if you Google me, I also happen to work sometimes for the New South Wales Department of Treasury. Now, for abundant clarity tonight, I am not here in my government capacity for reasons that will quickly become quite obvious. So, when I'm doing my PhD and not working at Treasury, I research international cooperation to do with space debris and also Antarctica. And basically what I figured out is that all of that involves a lot of booze. So, I'm hoping that this conclusion is profound enough to earn me a PhD in history and philosophy of science. I think it probably is. And in the meantime tonight, please help me out by having a drink and helping international cooperation occur. But I'm going to tell you a bit of a story to start with. So normally people uh, ask me about space junk, but recently a journalist got in contact and wanted to comment. He said that the Pentagon had put out a call for proposals to build a Death Star. Now I was fascinated and dug a little deeper. And what I found was actually that what they wanted to do was get proposals to build an on-orbit, multi-purpose platform with a bunch of robots on it to do some stuff. It may or may not be military, it's not entirely clear at this point, but it's not quite a Death Star. And generally speaking, I avoid talking about military things, um, if only because doing research on classified stuff is a really good way to get killed, and I like being alive. <laughs> But in this case, I thought I was on safe ground by pointing out that in 2013, about 30,000 Americans signed a petition asking for the US government to build a Death Star. And the US government actually responded and they said no, because it would be too expensive. They said that they thought it would cost around about uh, US 850 quintillion dollars. I had to Google what the word for it was because there are too many zeros. And uh, they also said that the administration does not support blowing up planets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it gets more complicated because I went to go and find the information to see how they'd costed that 850 quintillion because, you know, as a treasury person, I was interested. Um, but it turned out it's been removed, which led me to think that the current... US administration may have different ideas about a Death Star. <laughs> Nonetheless, 850 quintillion US dollars. Now, it occurred to me um, under the, you know, the things that we think about in these times that building a ready-made Death Star and then selling it to the US government plus a 20% profit for us may in fact be a really good way for Australia to make some money. So. Hey, ScoMo, do you want to build a Death Star? <laughs> and of course, if there was such a Death Star, it would have railings and also a cafeteria because Australia is a civilised country with rules on these things. But it occurred to me that it would be quite fun to try and figure out if under international law, it was possible for Australia to build a Death Star while still being in line with our international responsibilities, you know, under space treaties and stuff. Um, yes, space law is a real thing, and yes, space lawyers really exist. So, when you sing, you begin with do, re, mi, but when you do law, you begin with fucking everything ever. But <laughs> luckily, luckily for you guys, I'm not actually a real lawyer, so I'm just going to give you a highlights tour of the best bits of international space law in the remaining four minutes. Okay, now to preempt this, someone in the audience is going to corner me later and be like, hey, but... You know what, because international law isn't actually law because there's no jail and uh, I can do whatever I want and no one can do anything about it, so what are you going to say to that? And okay, if you want to play that game, bring it on, I do Krav Maga. But <laughs> let me point out that international law is actually the only thing that means that when you send your limited edition Sunset Ushi to someone in Barbaria for $10,000, <laughs> the plane does not get shot out of the sky. And I think that's pretty good. Um, as for the li limited edition Sunset Osha, it remains to be seen, but time will tell. Thank you for the, uh, the Bachelor Watchers here. So, if I were you, I would stop being so negative about space law because it's stopping you getting blown up. Alright, moving on. 
There are five space treaties you need to be across, only five. Like jazz, the, the real space law is in the spaces between the treaties. It's, it's the law that you don't make that really defines the parameters of the law. And the one that we need to know about for this is the Outer Space Treaty. It's the big hitter signed in 1967. The reason you need to know about it is because it stopped us all getting blown up because it basically got the USSR and the Americans to agree not to put nukes in space. Although I'm pretty sure that George Bush would still think there's we weapons of mass destruction there. Thank you. Thank you for all those people old enough. Um, so Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty puts up a bit of a problem for us, and you don't have to read it because I'll summarise it for you. It basically says you're not allowed to put weapons of mass destruction into orbit, um, which is a bit of a problem for us because, you know, a Death Star is a weapon of mass destruction. And to confirm that, I went and checked with my good friend Dan Porras, who works for the United Nations on space weapons, and he's literally the world expert in this. And he said, yes, a, space, uh, a Death Star is a weapon of mass destruction and under Article 4 would not be allowed, which is where most people would stop. But it's me, so I just get started. And I said, OK, Dan, but I see your point. But what if there was an object that was spherical and already in orbit around the Earth? Under the terms of the treaty, that wouldn't be launching it into orbit. That would be the moon. The moon is 3.5 k's in diameter, which is probably a little bit Wait, big what? for... What? what? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not a physicist, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was checking you were awake. How, how big is the moon? <laughs> it's a bit big, probably, for a Death Star. But, but Australia is already home to the big banana, <laughs> the big pineapple, the big merino, the big prawn, and more recently, the big mess on George Street. <laughs> so I thought, let's add a big Death Star. So a little bit of a complicated factor is that in addition to the Outer Space Treaty, Australia is also a party to the Moon Agreement. We're one of only 18 countries to have uh, signed up to it, which I think makes us hipster if nothing else does. <laughs> but essentially, to save you time, the Moon Agreement basically says the same thing, which is you can actually go and put stuff on the Moon as long as it's for science. And you can even use military personnel and equipment to do your science on the Moon. Um, and so basically, if we want to have a Death Star on the moon, all we need is a ready-made science project to go along with it. And luckily for us, I happen to know some people who are doing stuff with space lasers out of Mount Stromlo. The Space Environment Research Center are experimenting with firing lasers at pieces of space junk to move it in orbit. And I recently went and hung out with a bunch of their people. Yes, I'm almost done. Uh, with a bunch of their people. And I can confirm that it was very science-y. But also I learned that if you put the laser on the moon instead of on Earth from Mount Stromlo, not only would you not have the atmosphere messing with all of your wave fronts so it would be more effective, but I wouldn't have to go to Canberra all the time. So I'm in furious support of this plan. <laughs> or you could just tweet at Donald Trump if you really wanted to and he'll probably build it and make Mars pay for it but honestly he's got enough going on so I think we can leave him alone so I guess what we've learned is that the real Death Star was the space lore I made you all learn along the way and you are welcome ladies and gentlemen even if I don't know how big the moon is but on a serious note before I finish I'd like to say that I think that space lore is very important because I don't care who you are or whether you got a bottle of Gamer Girl bathwater or what. War in space is really bad for everybody. Everybody loses. And so far, space law has done a great job. But the real Death Star is actually all those people trying to make it seem like a cool thing to have war in space and making military rhetoric part of the norm. And that's not OK. And I'm not OK with it. So <laughs> let's do science, not war. And on that note, I will finish and let you get back to it. But if you want to know more or like yell at me more for not knowing how big the moon is, um, you can tweet me, you can email me, you can listen to my podcast, Space Junk Podcast, and uh, get in touch. But have a great night. Thank you. Annie Canva.